You know what occasionally happens on the street when two people are walking down the sidewalk straight at each other and they both decide to move to the right together and then to the left together and they somehow get stuck and they can't pass each other. Zen teachers will pull just exactly that sort of stunt when going down a path and meet one of their students to see if they can get him in a tangle and can he escape from it. And you will find in everyday life that there is a very clear distinction between people who always seem to be uh, self-possessed and people who are dithering and nervous and don't quite know how to react in any given situation, always getting embarrassed because they have their life too strongly programmed. You said, I mean, this is a common marriage argument. You said you would do such and such a thing at such and such a time. Now you've changed your plans. Not that they really, the change of plans really caused any inconvenience, but just the feeling that when you say you will do something at a certain time, you ought to do it at that time, come hell or high water. Well, that's being very unadaptable. That's being a stone kind of sticky uh, thing. If it, after all, doesn't matter when we do it, and uh, somebody is offended because the time has been changed, that's simply because they are attached to punctuality as a fetish. And this is one of the great problems. This is causes many automobile accidents. Men rushing home to be on time for dinner when they stayed late either working or they had to stop for a drink at some bar or uh, when the girl feels that she has to, if she has a fussy husband and she feels she has to have the dinner ready at exactly a certain moment, she ruins the cooking. You'd rather have a faithful wife and a bad cook. <laughs> I hope I'm not treading on any toes. <laughs> So, you see, we spend an awful lot of energy trying to make our lives fit images of what life is or should be, which they could never possibly fit. So, Zen practice is in getting rid of these images. But it's, it's so explosive socially to do that, and it so worries people, they get vertigo, they get dizzy, they don't know which end is up. There was a very uh, uh, interesting dinner party once where a Zen master was present and there was a geisha girl who uh, served so beautifully and had such style that he suspected she must have some Zen training. And after a while, he, when she paused to fill his sake cup, he bowed to her and said, I'd like to give you a present. And she said, I would be most honored. And he took the iron chopsticks that are used for the hibachi, the charcoal brazier, moving the charcoal around. He picked up a piece of red hot charcoal and gave it to her. Well, she instantly, she had very long sleeves on her kimono. She whirled the sleeves around her hands and took the hot charcoal, withdrew to the kitchen, dumped it, and changed her kimono because it was burnt through. Then she came back into the room and after a suitable interval she stopped before the Zen master and bowed to him and said, uh, I would like to give you, sir, a present. <laughs> and he said, uh, I would be very much honored. Of course, he was wearing a kimono, something like this. And uh, so she picked up a piece of coal and offered it to him. He immediately produced a cigarette and said, thank you, that's just what I needed. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, in the same way that we have this in our culture, certain people who are comedians, who know how to make jokes and gags in a completely unprepared situation, face them with anything, and uh, they somehow come through. So that is exactly the same thing in a special domain as Zen. Only the, the master of Zen does this in every life situation. 
But the important thing is to be able to do this. This is the secret. You must remember you can't make a mistake. Now, that's a very difficult thing to do. Because from childhood up, we have had to conform to a certain social game. And if you're going to conform to this game, you can make mistakes or not make mistakes. And so, this thing has gone into us all the time. You must do the right thing. There's certain conduct appropriate here, there's certain conduct appropriate there. And that sticks in us and gives us a double self all our lives long because we never grow up. Now, I only say, if that game begins to bore you and it begins to trouble you and give you ulcers and uh, all kinds of things, then you raise the problem of getting out of it. And therefore, you start to become interested in things like Zen. That is simply a symptom of your growing in a certain direction where you are tired of playing a certain kind of game you are as naturally flowing in another direction as if a tree were putting out a new branch so because you say oh well we people are interested in higher things you see that depends still on the differentiation of rank between the superior and the inferior people. But when you begin to see through that and grow out of that, you don't think any more of this superior and inferior classification. You don't think we are spiritual people who attend to higher things as distinct from these morons who are only interested in beer and television. <laughs> this is simply our particular form of life like there are crabs and there are spiders and there are sharks and there are sparrows and so on but remember in the process of growth the oak is not better than the acorn because what does it do it produces acorns or you could say just like I sometimes love to say that a chicken is one egg's way of becoming others. <laughs> so an oak is an acorn's way of becoming other acorns. Where is the point of superiority? The first verse of that poem I just quoted, first verse is, in the landscape of spring, there is nothing superior and nothing inferior. The flowering branches are naturally some short, some long. <laughs>